much. I want to talk with you today about a book that I encountered maybe 15 or more years ago. It was written by a man by the name of Michael Hart, H-A-R-T. Uh, Michael Hart wrote a book entitled The 100, A Ranking of the Most Influential Persons in History. Now, just think about this. This guy not only has the gall, the chutzpah, you know, chutzpah. That's a good Jewish word. Uh, it's, it means when you kill your mother and father and throw yourself on the mercy of the court because you're an orphan, you know. That's chutzpah. And this guy had the chutzpah to not only choose the 100 most important people in the world in history, but then rank them one to 100. Now, as you would expect, Jesus is in this list, of course, uh, and Michael Hart places him in the list. But what you might not expect is where Michael Hart put Jesus in the list of the 100 most influential people in history. Because he did not put Jesus number one. He did not put Jesus number two. In the most influential people in the history of the world, Michael Hart judged Jesus to be in position number three. Now, I know you're dying to find out uh, who is one and two, so let me tell you. This man placed Muhammad as number one because he started a large religious community. He placed Sir Isaac Newton as number two because he was a great scientist. And he placed Jesus number three. Now, as soon as this book came out, the 100, a ranking of the most influential persons in history, I sent my assistant, my secretary, to Barnes & Noble to buy the book. <laughs> I wanted to see if I was in there. <laughs> I wasn't. And you probably weren't either. But it was shocking to me to think that God who became flesh only ranked behind two men who were never and ever will be God. Obviously, Michael Hart doesn't know Jesus the way I know Jesus. He doesn't know the Jesus that I know. I know the Jesus that's recorded in God's Word in all four of the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I know the Jesus that is in flesh so he can identify with you and me. Now, I, I see Jesus as the most unique person in the world. Unfortunately, the world doesn't see him that way, evidenced by Michael Hart. In high school, in college, Students are being taught today that there are many religions, all of them equally good, all their founders equally talented, and all of them equally the way to God. Unfortunately, the world does not understand just how unique Jesus is and how different he is from all these other religious leaders. So I want to explore with you today from God's Word the uniqueness of Jesus. Why is he so different from everybody else? And I think we have time to look at four things. Number one, Jesus is the most unique person who ever lived because he's the only person born of God and man. Now think about this. He is God and he is in human flesh. He is man. And this is kind of a tricky theological thing because I've heard people say, well, Jesus is 100% God and he's 100% man. But those two are mutually exclusive because you can't be 100% and also 100%. I've heard people say, well, he's 50% God and 50% man. But that means he's only half a God. That's how tricky this is. And also shows how unique Jesus is. 
Listen to this. This is the angel telling Joseph in Matthew chapter 1 that he should go ahead and marry Mary. Do not be afraid to take to you Mary your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, and he will save his people from their sins. Now, that kind of announcement was not made when Muhammad was born. It was not made when the Buddha, Gautama, was born. It was not made when L. Ron Hubbard, the founder of Scientology, was born. In fact, it wasn't made when anybody was born, except Jesus the most unique person who ever lived. Now, now, why is his birth so unique? Why is the fact that he's born of God and man so unique? Well, first of all, his birth was prophesied. Prophets in the Old Testament talked about Jesus hundreds of years before his birth. For example, it was prophesied that he would be born of a virgin. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. That's not a common thing, you understand. That's a pretty unique birth of a virgin. Also, it was prophesied that he would be born in the little town of Bethlehem, a nowhere backwater town. And yet, Micah prophesied exactly where Jesus would be born. It was prophesied he would be born of the seed of David in Isaiah, and again in Jeremiah, and again in Zechariah. So his birth was prophesied many years before it took place. Now, as I remember, nobody prophesied my birth. I mean, there aren't a lot of prophets out there saying, oh, he's going to be born on this date. Nobody prophesied where I would be born. By the way, I was born in Elwood City, Pennsylvania, a little steel town north of Pittsburgh. In fact, the hospital in which I was born is now a residence assistant living for older people. If I move back to my town, get this, if I ever move from Nebraska back to my town, I could be born and die in the same building. <laughs> Jesus' birth was prophesied. Mine wasn't. Neither was yours. Jesus' birth was anticipated. Every young Jewish girl prayed to the Almighty God that she would be the one chosen by God to bear the Messiah to all of Israel. But only one had that joy. Only one had that experience. And only one birth was anticipated for hundreds of years. Now, my birth was anticipated, I'm glad to tell you, for about nine months. Not a big deal. But my birth wasn't anticipated for hundreds of years, and neither was Muhammad. When Muhammad was born, nobody knew, because he was nobody. When Jesus was born, his prophecy of Old Testament was fulfilled, and the anticipation of every young Jewish girl was fulfilled in Mary. His birth was a most unique birth, unlike anybody ever in the world. Oh, by the way, you remember that the birth of Jesus angered the local authorities. Uh, Herod the Great was so, was so jealous, was so difficultly caring about this young baby that he had all the little boys, two years and under, in the city of Bethlehem and the surrounding region. He slaughtered them all just to make sure Jesus was among the group. Jesus' birth angered the local authorities. When the Buddha was born, nobody was angered. As far as I know, when I was born, uh, the local police did not show up because they were mad that I was born. They didn't kill all the babies in the hospital. They didn't do anything because they weren't mad when I was born. They weren't mad when Muhammad was born. They weren't mad when you were born. But they were angered because Jesus was born. And that's true of nobody else. So his birth is absolutely unique. 
By the way, you understand that it is the birth of Jesus that divides history. It is the birth of Jesus in which we use the B.C. and the A.D. Jesus didn't just divide history. I think when Jesus was born, God invaded history. God invaded time. The God-man invaded time and changed the world forever. We even recognize that by saying, this is 2018, A.D. So the birth of Jesus is not just a, a day. It's not just a Christmas that you celebrate. The birth of Jesus is the most unique birth of any individual ever in the world. He is unique. Now, I understand that today people don't see Jesus as unique because we're inclusive today. We have to include every religion. We have to make them all the same. We have to be tolerant of everything. That's our world today. It does not change the fact that the birth of Jesus was unlike any other birth ever in history. So, if I'm looking at the uniqueness of Jesus... I have to say that being born of a virgin, his date deep being prophesied, his place being prophesied, that's true of nobody else except the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, here's the second reason why he is so unique, so different from everybody else. I'm going to Luke chapter 23 here to find out that Jesus is the only person ever crucified for the sins of others. Let me read, and then I'll say something about this. This is Luke 23, beginning at verse uh, 13. Then Pilate, when he had called together the chief priests, the rulers, and the people, said to them, you have brought this man to me as one who misleads the people. And indeed, I have examined him in your presence. I have found no fault in this man concerning those things of which you accuse him. No, neither did Herod. For I sent you back to him, and indeed, nothing deserving of death has been done by him. I will therefore chastise him and release him. You know the story, of course. Jesus is brought to Herod by Caiaphas and the Jewish ruler, rulers and the people, it says. They cannot crucify Jesus because the Roman government will not permit the Jews, to crucify. So they bring Jesus to Pilate, not for a trial, but for Pilate to say, I stamp my seal of approval and I will crucify him for you. It didn't happen. <laughs> not the way they thought. Because Pilate actually tried Jesus. Pilate asked Jesus more questions than the Sanhedrin did. It should have been the other way around. So here we have Jesus crucified. You know, there are many people who are crucified uh, for other people. You know, they, they die for others. Uh, Josephus, the historian in the first century, he wrote a book entitled Wars of the Jews. And in chapter 5, book 5, chapter 11, he says, So the soldiers out of wrath and hatred they bore for the Jews nailed those they crocked caught to crosses. Their multitude was so great that room was wanting for the crosses and crosses wanting for the bodies. Now, let me explain what that means. Josephus is saying that when Titus, the Roman general, came and destroyed the city of Jerusalem, 70 AD, Titus crucified so many Jewish people in Jerusalem that they couldn't find any more crosses. That means they couldn't find enough trees to cut down to make more crosses. They had cut down all the trees that were in that area. And what's even worse, he says, not only was there not additional wood to make crosses, there was not additional room around the wall of Jerusalem to put any more crosses because there were so many people crucified. Just think of how awful that was. And here's the thing. 
There are lots of people who are crucified, and there are lots of people who are crucified uh, for their country, you know, in World War I, World War II, Vietnam, uh, Afghanistan, and the list goes on. But Jesus didn't die for his country. He died for the world. He came to seek and save those who are lost. So Jesus' death on the cross was very different from any other crucifixion. There are some people who die as martyrs. Uh, John Wycliffe, for example, who gave us an English Bible. John Wycliffe was so hated by the Church of England, after they killed him, he was buried in Belgium, and some years later, they went out and dug up his bones, his body, and burned it. <laughs> after he was dead. That's how much John Wycliffe paid so you could have this Bible in your language, English. Yeah, there are people who are crucified or are killed. They die as martyrs. That's true. But Jesus wasn't a martyr. The only person who did not want Jesus on that cross was Satan. Because if Jesus dies on that cross for your sins, then Satan has no way to prevent your salvation. Who wanted to be on that cross? Jesus did. He struggled in the Garden of Gethsemane because he was human. But he yielded to the will of the Heavenly Father and the eternal plan for your salvation. And he died on that cross, not just to die, but he died for your sins and mine. And that's pretty unique. Muhammad didn't die for anybody. Well, he left behind several of his wives at the time. But he didn't die for your sins. He couldn't. He wasn't perfect. Buddha, the Buddha didn't die for your sins. Ron Hubbard certainly didn't die for your sins. Left a few yachts behind and a whole lot of money and a really wacko system of belief called Scientology. Now, he didn't die for your sins. He couldn't. But Jesus did. And who besides Jesus could? Nobody. That's what makes Jesus so unique. His birth is unlike any other birth in history. And his death on a cross for your sins is unlike any other death in history. So now we have two reasons to understand that Jesus is the most unique person who ever lived. But there are more. Jesus is the only person who was ever raised from the dead to live forever to make it possible for you to be raised from the dead. Matthew chapter 28, verse 5. The angel answered and said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen as he said. Come, see the place where the Lord lay. As he said. See, Jesus told them time and time again, told the disciples, I'm going to Jerusalem, I'm going to be mistreated and abused by the Sanhedrin and the Jewish council, and I'm going to die in Jerusalem. And the disciples, it, they were numb to that. They didn't seem to understand it at all. But it happened just as Jesus said. So his birth is unique, his death is unique, and now we have the third day, Jesus is rising from the dead. That's not a pretty common thing. You know, all the dead people in Holidaysburg aren't going to rise from the dead today. Not likely. But Jesus rose from the dead. And not just to be alive, because there were many others, about eight or so in the Bible, where they were dead and they were raised from the dead. You remember some of those examples. Peter, for example, raised Tabitha from the dead. Uh, Paul raised Eutychus from the dead. 
Elisha raised the Shunammite son from the dead. Jesus not only raised himself from the dead, he also raised Jairus' daughter. He raised the widow of Nain, and he raised his good friend Lazarus from the dead. So Jesus is not the only person to be raised from the dead. That's not what makes his resurrection unique. What makes it unique is his resurrection was the seed planted for your resurrection. And just as his death on the cross was for you, not for him, his resurrection was for you, not for him. Jesus was God. He could could raise the dead whenever he wanted to. But he did the third day as was predicted because his resurrection brings your justification. That's what the Bible says. You and I could not be justified in the sight of God without the resurrection of Jesus. Does that make his resurrection unique? Oh, you betcha. There's nobody else who can claim that. Muhammad certainly can't claim that. A science teacher in college can't claim that. I can't claim that. You can't claim that. But Jesus can. The unique person, the most unique person in all of history is not number three, folks. He's number one. If you were really to correct Michael Hart's list, based on the uniqueness of Jesus and just the things we've said so far, Jesus would not be number three. He would be number one. Number two. Number three. Number four. Go all the way to 100 and then keep on going. Because there is nobody like Jesus. I think that's important today in our climate where other religions are pushed on young people in high school, in college. And we're told to be inclusive and every, everybody is as good as everybody else. That just isn't true. We can see in God's word that Jesus is the most unique person who ever lived. Now, listen to this. Not only is he the most unique person who ever lived, I, I've had the joy, uh, not joy, let me say that differently. I've had the opportunity to see the graves of many well-known people in the world. Uh, My time on the radio, 23 years, uh, I traveled very heavily, which is probably why I'm using this cane today. Uh, I've preached in 112 countries, all seven continents. And here's the thing. I, I stood before the grave of Louis Pasteur in Dole, France, a little tiny town, It's grave just behind a little tiny picket fence. You'd never know it was there. On the other hand, I visited uh, Arlington National Cemetery and stood before the eternal flame that burns of JFK. I've looked at Napoleon's tomb in Paris, stood before it. I have decided in looking at those and other important people's graves including Wild Bill Hickok. I've decided if you dig up those graves, you're going to find one thing in all of them. Bones. You're going to find dead people. You're going to find Muhammad dead in the ground. You're going to find the Buddha, not under his tree, but dead in the ground. You're going to find Louis Pasteur and Napoleon and JFK and everybody else dead in the ground. But you're not going to find Jesus dead in the ground. He is the only person who ever lived who was raised from the dead to live forever and ever and provide for you justification when you stand before God. Nobody can do that for you except Jesus. One final thing. Jesus is the only person capable of saving the world from its sin. You know, we're we're all sinners. We understand that. We experience that every day in our own lives. 
And Muhammad just simply cannot save all the Muslims. Never said he could, never claimed he could. But Acts chapter 4, verse 12 says, There is none other name given among men whereby we must be saved. Only Jesus. That's it. Just one. In fact, Jesus himself said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now you think about that. Jesus didn't say, my buddy Muhammad and I are the way. And my good friend Buddha and I are the truth. And Pastor Richie and I are the life. He didn't say that. He said, it's me, the unique one. I'm the way. I'm the truth. I am the life. Nobody gets to the Father unless they come through me. That is the most exclusivistic statement of any religion. There's only one way, Jesus said, and it's me. Believing Christ died, that's history. Believing Christ died for you, that's salvation. That's the uniqueness of Jesus. I ran across this little story uh, some years ago now, and you may have heard it before. It's, it's just a, it touched my heart, and I want to share it with you. If you've heard it before, enjoy it again. Years ago, a very wealthy man, along with his devoted young son, shared a passion for collecting art. Together, they traveled around the world, adding only the finest art treasures to their collection. Priceless works by Picasso, Van Gogh, Monet, and others adorned the walls of the family estate. The old man looked on with satisfaction as his only child became an experienced art collector. The son's trained eye and sharp business mind caused his father to beam with pride. As winter approached, war engulfed the nation, and the young man left to serve his country. After only a few short weeks, his father received a telegram. His son died while carrying a fellow soldier to a medic. Distraught and lonely, the old man faced the upcoming Christmas holidays with anguish and sadness. On Christmas morning, a knock came on the old man's door. He was greeted by a soldier with a large package in his hand. He introduced himself as the man whose life the son had saved. The old man invited him in. As they began to talk, the soldier told of how the man's son often mentioned his love of fine art. I'm an artist, said the soldier, and I want to give this to you. The old man unwrapped the package, revealing a portrait of his son. Although not a work of genius, the painting featured the young man's face with striking detail. Overcome with emotion, the man thanked the soldier, promising to hang the picture above the fireplace, pushing aside priceless paintings. And then the man sat in his chair and spent Christmas gazing at the gift he had been given. The following spring, the old man became ill and passed away. The art world was abuzz, waiting in anticipation for the day the man's masterpieces could be auctioned off. According to the will of the old man, the old man's will, all the artworks were to be auctioned on Christmas Day, the day he had received his greatest gift, the painting of his son. Art collectors from all over the world gathered to bid on some of the world's most spectacular paintings. The auction began with a painting that was not on anyone's museum list. It was the painting of the man's son. The auctioneer asked for an opening bid. The room was silent. Who will open the bidding with $100? No one spoke. From the back of the room, someone shouted, who cares about that painting? 
It's just a picture of his son. Let's get on with the good stuff. No, said the auctioneer. We have to sell this one first, replied the auctioneer. Now, who will take the son? Finally, a friend of the old man spoke. He said, will you take $10 for the painting? That's all I have. I knew the boy, and I'd like to have it. I have $10. Will anyone go higher, called the auctioneer. Again, more silence. The auctioneer said, going once, going twice, sold. The gavel fell, cheers filled the room, and someone exclaimed, now we can get to the masterpieces. But the auctioneer looked at the audience and announced that the auction was over. Stunned disbelief quieted the room. Someone spoke up and asked, what do you mean it's over? What about all these paintings? There are millions of dollars of art here. I demand you explain what's going on. The auctioneer replied, it's very simple. According to the will of the father, whoever takes the son gets it all. Whoever takes the son gets it all. That's a promise of the uniqueness of Jesus. When you come to the son in faith, you get it all. That's why I'm a follower of the most unique person who ever lived.